Okay, wait. let's see, recording is going now. Okay, I think we're done then, we're, we're set. All right, uh, welcome everyone to the seminar on arithmetic geometry and quantum field theory. Uh, today, it's a great pleasure to have Eric Panzer from Oxford, and he's going to tell us about deformation, quantization, and multiple zeta values. Uh, Eric, over uh, to you. Thank, thank you, Mignon. Thanks very much for this uh, opportunity to speak. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, and I'm, at the moment, my setup is, is a bit elementary, so I don't see anybody's faces or uh, anybody's comments in the chat when I speak. So if, if anything comes up, uh, please uh, just uh, raise your, your voice, turn, turn yourself on and just uh, ask a question. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to be interrupted at any moment if that helps. Uh, otherwise, I just assume everything is fine and I keep going. Um, all right, so, so I'm going to talk about a recent work um, that I did with uh, Peter Banks and Brent Pym. And, and that is about deformation quantization and particular connection between deformation quantization and number theory in, in a sense. Um, but in the, I decided in the first part of the talk, I will give a gentle introduction to, to what this all, all is about. So in case you have not seen uh, deformation quantization before, then I hope this gives you some vague idea. And if you do, you can, uh, grab yourself a tea or might do something else during the first part of the talk uh, until I get to um, the second half where I will explain the, uh, the result and, and some of its uh, ingredients. So the, the, the main idea you see on this first slide is that uh, what you want to do in quantization in general is um, that you start with, at least from a physicist's viewpoint, you start with classical systems with classical mechanics, for example, and you want to quantize it, whatever that means, and it's something that resembles quantum mechanics. And one um, way to phrase this that is pretty much universal is, is uh, about looking at the, the algebra of, of observables. So in classical mechanics, you have observables like positions and momenta of particles, say. And those are just functions that you can measure and they, they commute. That's what you see on the left. Whereas in quantum mechanics, uh, one of the key properties is that things are represented by operators and they don't commute. And, and that has consequences like the uncertainty principle and so on. So one way to, to characterize this transition from the classical to the quantum is that you start with something commutative and you make it non-commutative. And this is what the deformation quantization focuses on this point of view. And then in the process of quantization, how do you make this transition? How do you introduce this non-commutativity? Uh, it turns out that uh, in the known approaches in particular, the one that I'm going to talk about is the one by Konsevich. Uh, there is an injection somehow in some mysterious way how suddenly uh, transcendental numbers like uh, powers of pi or the Riemann zeta function show up. And uh, this is what I'm going to talk about in the second half of the talk. But now for the beginning, let me just uh, try to um, remind you of uh, some basic aspects of classical mechanics. So. Uh, suppose we have a, a single particle moving in, in one dimension, so it has a coordinate x and it has a momentum p. Then we would uh, parameterize the possible states of the system in the so-called phase space. So in this case, it would be two-dimensional vector space with these two coordinates, momentum and position. And then what is an observable? An observable is any function on this phase space. So in particular, the position and momentum themselves but there are many other observables in which you can uh, make out of these. In particular, one is very important. It's called the Hamiltonian or the total energy of the system. So if you have a potential V uh, that's position dependent, then you have V of X as the potential energy and some kinetic energy P squared over two M say. But any function on the uh, phase space would be an observable in the classical setup. Then an interesting algebraic structure you have just with these ingredients is, is, is the Poisson bracket. So if you take two observables, say F and G, so both are functions of X and P, then you can form this, this combination you see on the right of the partial derivatives with respect to X and P in this anti-symmetric uh, anti fashion. And what is the, the role of this? Why is this relevant for anything? Well, it turns out that uh, you can formulate the equations of motions in this way. So this is Hamilton's formulation of uh, dynamics. 
So suppose now, instead of just a single state X and P, you want to know how the particle moves over time. So it's position and momentum, they change. So X and P become functions of what's called the time T. And then you need to know how does position and momentum depend on time. And the differential equations, which you know, uh, well, essentially the, the position is defined to be the velocity of the particle up to the, the mass. So if you divide momentum P by mass, you get the velocity. Um, but interestingly, when you look at this equation, uh, you see that uh, you can also get this from the derivative of the Hamiltonian, right? So the derivative of Hamiltonian by P is um, exactly this, this velocity, the time evolution of X. And then when you stare a little bit at this Poisson bracket, then you, you see that you actually can write this also as a commutator. Yeah, if you, if you, I mean, a commutator in this Poisson sense. So if you compute the Poisson bracket with P and H, uh, then you will find that you get exactly, uh, sorry, with, with X and H, you will find that you get exactly this partial derivative over P, which is then the time evolution of X. And similarly with P, so the, the time evolution of the momentum, uh, that's essentially the acceleration or, or the force, which is the, the negative gradient of the potential. And then this partial H by dx, you can also write as a Poisson bracket of P with H. So the adoption of all of this is that you can write the equations of most of any observable X and P uh, as a Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. So some of the, the Poisson bracket is the algebraic structure that tells us the time evolution of any observable F for a given Hamiltonian. So, so that is the, the Hamiltonian uh, description of such a system. And in particular, when you look at this Poisson bracket, you can uh, look at the, these fundamental canonical brackets between the position and momentum themselves. And um, well, because it's anti-symmetric, X and X and P and P give you zero. And, but then the crucial one is that X and P give a Poisson bracket, which is one, and in particular, it's non-zero. So, so much uh, about classical mechanics in, in one slide. Now, what would be the quantum description of such a system? Well, that looks uh, a bit different. So, so what happens now is that, that suppose we are in the position description of quantum mechanics, then uh, the, the state would now be described by a so-called wave function. So we consider a function psi on the real line with complex values. And then the state space, the, the possible states of the system is actually a Hilbert space of the square integrable functions of this type. And you should imagine them as this kind of, kind of a probability distribution that tells you somehow how likely it is to find a particle at a certain place. And so now we have a very different state space. And what is an observable now? Well, this is the crucial bit where operators come in. So uh, position is now an operator X hat, which in this representation is just the multiplication by X in the, of the wave function. And uh, the momentum operator corresponds to derivative minus imaginary unit H bar derivative with respect to X. And this H bar here is the, the Planck's uh, constant that uh, uh, will come up later again. Uh, at this stage, it's, it's a fundamental property of our universe. Um, so, so we have these operators now that correspond to these uh, initial observables. Um, but now what is an actual value? Well, the only thing you can do is you can look at expectation values. So you have this position operator X hat and you are on a given state Psi then here on the right, you see what the expected value of the position would be. So um, while it doesn't have a sharp value, usually it could be anywhere with a different probability. So the absolute value of Psi squared, Psi bar Psi, that's the probability to find it at a place. So if you wait, if, if, if you wait this, the, the position with this uh, probability, this is the average or the expected value. Um, and this is the quantity that you could then compared to the classical notion of the position of a particle if you wanted to. And, but now we face the same question, what is the dynamics? What we've just talked about in a fixed state, how do things evolve over time? And now we have to ask Schrodinger, uh, 
um, and he said the following. So now we introduce a time dependence, so the, the wave function also depends on the time. And then we want to know what is the time derivative. And Schrodinger's equation is on the left, tells you that the time derivative of, of a state is given by uh, the action of the Hamiltonian now as in its operator version. And then you ask, well, what does it mean uh, when, uh, for, for the expectation values? So now you look at an expectation value. And if you look at the, the way the expectation value is defined, right, you have two psi's in there. You have a psi bar and a psi. So if you apply this partial derivative with respect to time on this expectation value, you get two terms. One, you first derive psi bar, and then you have x, or and another term where you uh, act with a derivative on the psi at the back. And if you translate this, uh, what this means, when you work this out, you get two terms. And one, and you can then interpret them again as expectation values. And well, there will be one where you first have uh, acted on the psi, or the other one where you have acted afterwards. Long story short, you get this commutator. So the the time evolution of the expectation value is the expectation value of a commutator. F had commutated with uh, the observable operator, commutated with the Hamiltonian operator. So you should already see the, the analogy with the classical setup. So here somehow the commutator plays a big role and you could in particular compute the commutators of these position and momentum operators with themselves, which is of course zero because the commutator is anti-symmetric. And then the crucial thing about quantum mechanics is that position and momentum are not commuting. The commutator of them is I times the Planck constant. And this is really what you can trace all the quantum effects back to. So in particular, for example, the, the uncertainty principle and the fact that you cannot measure position and momentum in quantum mechanics with arbitrary precision at the same time is exactly encapsulated by this non-commutativity here. And somehow the H bar tells you how non-commutative you are, right? If you would have H bar equals zero and everything would be commutative and there would be nothing quantum about this, uh, but the bigger H bar, some of the more the quantum effects uh, play a role in this physics. So this is the slide about quantum mechanics. Now let's try to uh, recap the, the analogy here. So in classical mechanics, we described um, the state by, by a phase space and then an observable was a function on this phase space. Whereas in quantum mechanics, you had an underlying Hilbert space of wave functions and an observable would correspond to an operator. Then we had this, these equations for the dynamics, the Hamilton equation and the Schrodinger equation, which look extremely similar. So, um, and we, we looked at these basic commutators or basic Poisson brackets. And all the, if, you, if you look at this, then you will uh, be led to this principle that's called canonical quantization, which is the following prescription. So say you start with a classical system, uh, you have some state space, you have a Poisson bracket. Now you want to quantize it, so you want to get some Hilbert space and some operators on it. And how should the two be related? Well, according to this prescription, you want that the, the commutator of the operators on the left should take the role of the Poisson bracket, right? So somehow if you take a Poisson bracket and the corresponding operator in a quantization, that should be the commutator of the operators corresponding to its arguments with this IH bar in front as we see here. Um, and then there are these H bar higher order corrections. So it turns out that this precise analogy you have here, it works for X and P itself. But if you want to look at polynomials in X and P, for example, if you really want to define this quantization map on the whole algebra uh, of observables, then you see that uh, you have to, to, to weaken this exact correspondence a little bit and there have to be subleading corrections here to higher orders in H bar, but to first order in H bar, uh, you want to have this identification of the Poisson bracket with the operator commutator. So this is the idea behind canonical quantization. Um, 
but there's actually something missing in this uh, picture here, right? So first of all, let me remind you that um, when we set h bar to zero, right, then everything is commutative in the quantum setup. Whereas in the classical setup, there's always commutative, right? The, the function on the phase space under pointwise multiplication, it's always a commutative algebra. Whereas in the quantum case, uh, obviously we have a non-trivial commutator of operators. So uh, we only get commutativity in this limit. And in general, the operator product is non-commutative. So somehow what's missing in this picture uh, on the left-hand side, on the classical side, is a non-commutative product that then takes the role of the operator product. Yeah. So what we already have on the classical side is what the commutator of the star product should be. It should be the Poisson bracket, but we don't have the product itself. Now, of course, if you have an actual quantization, if you would have a, if you would have a Hilbert space and a map that assigns to every function on state space, an operator on the Hilbert space, so if you would have an honest canonical quantization, um, then we could define the star product by going backwards, right? We could say, we have two observables f and g, and then let's take the operators f hat and g hat in the quantization. Now these are operators on the Hilbert space, so we can multiply them. This gives us a new operator. And if you have a perfect correspondence, then that should be the operator corresponding to some function on phase space. And that function we denote f star g. Okay. Are there any questions to uh, at this stage about this idea of the star product, what it should be. So sorry, so you're saying that there's a canonical quantization if every operator comes from a function on uh, phase space? Oh, well, um, I mean, there are some questions about uh, convergence and density here. Um, so I'm not making that claim, but if, if you would have Suppose in a, in a, a nice enough situation, um, then you would uh, hope that this exists. But in general, I, I don't think it will, no. So you're saying that when you multiply these two operators together, I would think it's just some operator in the Hilbert space. It might not come from a function of phase space. And you're saying you expect every operator, some dense yeah. set of operators in Hilbert space to come from function. Yeah. So, so, so in particular, what I'm going to do is, sorry, so in particular, think of what happens when you have a very small perturbation, right? If the, if the, if the H bar is zero, then the product is commutative. So you know it is actually the same as F times G. Um, and now the idea is that somehow you want this quantization to be a smooth thing. So you, it should be a series in H bar, and then you should be able to lift it at least term by term. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I hope that answers your question at some point, but I will never in this talk, I will never address questions about convergence uh, and exactness. Right. So, but then if you have this one to one correspondence, then you should have a commutative product on the operators. Yes, you can also define that if you want. Okay. But uh, that, that somehow that's not so interesting, right? I mean, the, you're right, uh, you could define that. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So, so this is the, the motivation why uh, from, from a physical point of view, you might want to look at the star product. I mean, of course in physics, you, if you want to do physics, you have to have a state, you have to have a Hilbert space, you have to have the operators. Um, but if you just want to ask the question about quantization, is it possible to quantize something? Or what is what are questions or properties about the quantization that you can ask that are independent of the actual choice of Hilbert space and the actual quantization, because typically there's many different ways to quantize to construct these Hilbert spaces and so on. So that, that's the, the origin of the idea to focus on the left-hand side. So and, and the rest of it will completely forget about the operators and the Hilbert spaces and everything. And we stay ex exclusively on the left-hand side. So let, let's try to summarize the data that's uh, sitting there. So we, we start with a, with a state space. And for simplicity, I will only consider R to the D, you know, just Euclidean state space. So there's no 
interesting topology here or so that could, could cause globalization problems or whatever. We're just an R to the D. And what is the, the data? Well, we have this Poisson bracket. Um, and what is the Poisson bracket? Well, it has to be uh, an anti-commuting uh, bilinear form. So it's odd. It also has to fulfill the Jacobi identity. So it's actually a Lie bracket. Uh, and the third rule is a Leibniz rule. So you want this thing to act uh, a kind of as a derivative in both arguments. So if you remember the, the canonical Poisson bracket that we saw at the very beginning, bracket FG was partial X, F partial P, G, and then minus the opposite. It was a first order operator in each individual argument. And this is what this Leibniz rule represents. So somehow it should, it should act like a linear operator, a first order differential operator in both arguments. So these are the defining properties of a Poisson bracket. And then deformation quantization would tell you, well, if we can quantize this, uh, we would get uh, a product, a star product, that's what we call it, uh, on this algebra of functions. And uh, this will, de will depend on H bar. And uh, again, in order to avoid any convergence questions, we will treat everything formal. So everything will be formal power series in H bar. And then what are the, the properties of this star product that, that we know or that we would like? Well, um, it definitely had better be uh, associative. Right? If you think about the, the operator product on a Hilbert space, uh, even though it's non-commutative, it's certainly associative. So um, we would expect this star product to be associative. Secondly, uh, we want uh, this to make sense in a perturbation sense. So what we want is that for H bar equals zero, we want the product the star product to be commutative and to be just the ordinary product. Right, so this goes back to the two things I mentioned earlier a little bit. Um, so this is equation two here. So we want that the star product can be written uh, as a power series in H bar and it starts with F times G. So it's in some sense, you could think of it, we normalized our parameterization such that for no quantum effects, we've, um, that this product then is the normal commutative product. And then everything else is the formal power series in H bar. And we just give names to these coefficients Bn, right? So every coefficient in H bar of the star product, well, it's some operator Bn of F and G, uh, whatever it is, these operators define the star product. And then the third property is why well, we want to make some connection with the Poisson bracket. Um, and this is the principle of canonical quantization that I showed on the slide before that the commutator of these operators should be I H bar times the Poisson bracket uh, up to higher order corrections. So these are the three properties that we ask uh, of a star product of a given Poisson bracket. And because everything here is a formal power series, this is, is a completely algebraic problem, right? So, so we are looking for an associative product on this form of power series ring, which has these properties. And in particular, you see that the, the second and third property are easy to do, right? I mean, you can choose any operators BN, all you have to make sure is that at zero of order, you take the given commutative product. And then at the next step, you just have to make sure that you choose your B1, which is the linear term in H bar. You choose it in such a way that it's anti-commutator. I mean, that is anti-symmetric version is exactly this Poisson bracket. And then the, the higher Bs, they don't play any role for equations two and three. So well, what is the crux here is the associativity. If you write out the associativity, uh, once you've chosen B1 say, and then you write out equation one, you get some constraints on B2. So you have to choose B2 in such a way that it makes this equation here hold to order H bar squared and so on and so forth. So you get a lot of uh, constraints of these higher BNs inserted into each other in various ways that you have to fulfill in order to get an associative product. And this is why this is not at all 
obvious uh, how to how to solve this problem. And for a long time, it wasn't known. So there were there are special construction, constructions you can do, uh, in particular for symplectic um, Poisson brackets. But for a generic, uh, an arbitrary Poisson bracket on R to the D, um, it took a long time for to, to solve this problem. And uh, the answer is, well, indeed, it is possible. So for every Poisson bracket, you can define a star product with all of these properties. And this is a result in a paper of Konsevich from 1997. And um, I want to explain this uh, in, in some level of detail because that's what the, the work later on is about. But maybe um, as a kind of breakpoint in between. So, so far what I've done is explained uh, the idea of uh, deformation quantization, taking a commutative algebra, defining a non-commutative product. And the big result of Konsevich is that it's always possible and in particular in a kind of universal way. So there's one formula that you can write down that works for all Poisson brackets. So that's what's the universal, uh, what's universal about this formula. So let me, um, unless there are questions at this stage, let me explain this formula and its ingredients. So remember these BN are coefficients of the star product. So they act on two functions, F and G. F and G are functions on R to the D on the state space. BN takes these two functions and uh, spits out some other function. And Konsevich writes these as an expansion in a, in a sum of over graphs. So that's something very familiar from perturbation theory and quantum, in perturbative quantum field theory, for example. So it's a kind of Feynman graph expansion, only that this is a Konsevich graph expansion. So there is uh, some combinatorics and graphs involved here. Um, so, so what are these graphs? Uh, you see some examples here. Um, the first thing to note is that these are directed graphs. Every edge has a direction. And they have two types of vertices. So there are these uh, blue vertices that are drawn on the bottom. Uh, there will always be exactly two of those. And one of them we call left and another one we call right. Um, and then you have a bunch of black vertices and the number of those is exactly the order of H bar. Yeah, so if you compute uh, the coefficient of h bar to the one in the star product, so you compute the operator b1, you would only sum over the graphs which have a single black vertex. And then the, uh, the final rule is that every black vertex has two outgoing edges. And the blue vertices have no edges going up. So this means if, if you're in this b1 case, you have only a single black vertex, there's only one thing you can do but you have to have two edges going out of the black vertex. Uh, so they can go to the left or to the right, but there are these uh, symmetry rules here that are drawn here on the right that first of all, you cannot have an edge going back to its starting vertex. So such a self loop um, is, is not, not allowed. And also you cannot have two parallel edges. So the only thing you can do here really is to send one edge to the left and one edge to the right blue vertex. So in this Konsevich formula, there's a single term only in the sum, if you're in the case n equals one, and, in, and it's exactly this one graph. So he says there is a star product, which to order h bar is given by a single term, uh, b of the graph times w of this graph. And this b is indexed by a graph now, is a differential operator that I will explain shortly. And this wg is a real number. So if, if you want uh, these, uh, all, all the differential structure and the Poisson bracket go into this differential operator BG. And what the talk is going to be about um, is this coefficient WG. Um, but just before we continue, let's, let's see what happens at uh, order two, N equals two. So we have two black vertices. So this is now the H bar squared uh, correction to, to the stop product. Uh, it turns out there's four, graphs you can draw. You can either have uh, both vertices going to one left, one right, 
um, or you can have one edge going to the other black vertex and then complete it like this. And then the final case, remember that I said that parallel edges are not allowed, but this is, this is still okay here, what I've drawn at the very bottom right, because uh, these edges are anti-parallel. You have an edge from one black vertex to the other and an edge back. So, the, so that is allowed and that is important. You have, to, you have to take that into account, otherwise the conservage formula would not work. Um, and so on. So I, I hope uh, you can, can see the picture here. So at each order in N, there's a finite number of these graphs. So there's a finite little formula for the B operator at this stage. Um, so if there's no questions, then I'll explain what this operator does. So now I'm talking about the differential operator BG in this formula. Um, and then at the very end, I'll talk about the real number. So luckily this operator is very intuitively defined. So I only do one example and I promise you, you get the idea. So let's look at this graph. So this is an N equals two graph. It has two black vertices. Um, and we want to define a differential operator that acts on F and G. So what you should do is you should think of these blue vertices, F and G. I mean, one is left, one is right. And you should just think of them as F and G. So I put F and G in these blue vertices. And then every black vertex, you should think of a Poisson bracket. Uh, so I have two Poisson brackets here for the black vertices. And well, you can ask a Poisson bracket of what? Um, so what we do is we take the coordinates of our R to the D, X1 up to XD. And you put these coordinate functions in the Poisson bracket. Um, I, J, K, L, whatever the indices are. And then you define a differential operator. So, so let's, let's go this, through this step by step. Um, so what you do is every vertex in this graph gives you a factor. So the, the, this first vertex here on the top left, the first black vertex, this is just a Poisson bracket of X, I, and X, J. That's it. Nothing more to be done. Now you have another black vertex, another Poisson bracket, X, K, X, L. But now something funny happens because you have an incoming edge. So there's an edge coming from the red vertex to this blue vertex. And this edge will correspond to a partial derivative. So you take a partial derivative of this Poisson bracket and which one, well, exactly the one by DXJ. Yeah, because you should think of this edge as coming from the XJ here in the Poisson bracket. Okay, and now it continues. So you have a, another vertex, a function F here at the bottom left and it has two incoming edges. So you will get two differential operators acting on it, the partial I and the partial K. And finally, you have G with just a single derivative by XL. So you have, you have this part of these four factors for the four vertices in the graph. Uh, and I still haven't specified all these indices, uh, but you will see that there is like a, a match, right? So every X appears also with a derivative somewhere else. So if you would use an Einstein summation con a convention with writing sense upstairs and downstairs, then you would have a full contracted object here. Uh, I just write the, the sum of all possible values of these indices. Uh, and that's it. So, so the rule is for every graph, um, you write Poisson brackets in each vertex, in each black vertex, in the blue vertices you write F and G, and then you, every edge becomes a derivative and you sum of all indices. So this is the rule for the operator. So you see that this defines an op differential operator on, on F and G. You will also see in this case, it's not first order in F and G, right? It's, it's second order in F, uh, but that's okay because remember the, the first order was only, because of these higher order corrections, um, the, the whole thing um, will, will in general, in general you will get nth order operators uh, at order Bn. But if we were looking at B1, say the graph I drew before, this graph here on the left, which corresponds to the star product order one, then you have a single derivative on F and a single derivative on G. And it turns out in this case, the, the operator is really just the Poisson bracket. Right, you have the Poisson bracket here with all coordinates, you act on F and G, 
So the, the operator in the first, for the first graph at n equals one is actually just the Poisson bracket. Okay, so we, we understood the operators. And now let's look at the uh, coefficients. So how do you define these coefficients? Now, now this is where the integrals come in. And, and this is what I will talk uh, about for the rest of the talk. So uh, let me explain this in some detail. How, how do we go about this? Um, we're assigning coordinates to the vertices and you should think of these vertices as moving around in the upper half plane. So remember we had two, two special vertices, the blue one and, um, and one was called left and one was called right. So let's think of these two vertices as sitting at the origin and at the number one in the complex plane. And then we had N black vertices and each of them could be anywhere in the upper half plane. Okay. Then if you're thinking of, of such an assignment of complex numbers to every vertex, then we can define differential forms. And the one that Kontsevich first um, used was, was this one here. So suppose you have an edge going from I to J. Remember every edge is directed, so it's important, it goes from I to J. Uh, then what we can do is we can look at this fraction here, zi minus the j over zi bar, complex conjugate, minus the j, and take the argument. And then the corresponding differential, it's what's called d phi ij. So one way to think about this is as an angle, right? So zi minus the j, the argument of this, this measures the, the, the angle uh, from the origin between, uh, sorry, uh, the angle between zi and the j, and you subtract the angle between zi bar and the j. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't do a picture here, but you can also interpret this as the kind of hyperbolic angle of the triangle between zi, the j, and infinity. So this is, you should really think of this as an angle, and it's normalized by 2 pi. So, so what this means is that if you have a configuration of these points in the upper half plane, then for every edge, you can define an angle. Um, and then you wedge all of these angle forms together. And, and now remember that uh, every of these n vertices had two outgoing edges. So in total, there's two n edges. So we get a two n form if we wedge all of these angle forms together. And the degrees of freedom we had was choosing these points in the upper half plane, the black vertices. So for each one, we can choose the real and imaginary part. So uh, we get a two n dimensional integration domain, which is uh, n times the upper half plane. So this, this matches up. We have a two n fold integral of a two n form. Uh, so you can define this number wg, this integral. Uh, of course, I mean, you have to show that this thing converges and makes sense, uh, which in this case is is doable in, in more general cases uh, for another kind of angle form here. It's actually much more tricky. Um, but anyway, so we know that this integral is convergent. And in this case, it gives us a real number. And these are the coefficients in Konsevich's formula. So the statement is you take these very simple differential operators that I showed on the slide before that for every graph, you take this differential operator which depends on the Poisson structure and acts on the functions f of g. And you just multiply these operators with these uh, real numbers here, and then you get a star product. And, and notice that these are universal, right? So this definition, there's no Poisson bracket here. There's no f and g here. So these coefficients really only depend on the graph and on nothing else. So they're universal numbers that you have to compute once and for all. Um, okay, so maybe to, to make this more concrete, let me do an example. So I'll do the example of the simplest graph, of course, um, which gives you the first order in H bar of Kontsevich's star product. So this is the graph. We have one black vertex with then one edge going to each blue one. And what is the integral? 
I mean, I've written it down the following way. So, so remember the, the way the form was defined was for an edge going from here to here, you take the difference of the Z's divided by the complex conjugate. Now, because the left vertex is at zero and uh, this thing is at Z1, the black vertex is Z1, which I just call Z, the, the, the difference between the Z's here is just Z. And the difference between the Z's of the black one and the right blue vertex one is Z minus one. So what you get is you just get log of Z over Z bar and log of Z minus one over Z bar minus one. And I've sneakily uh, taken away the D here of this D log and written it in the formula. So the integral would be the integral over the upper half plane, the, the position of the black vertex of D alpha, where alpha is this one form. And when you take the D alpha, you get exactly the wedge of these two angle forms. I mean, why have I written it this way? Of course, we want to apply Stokes theorem. This is the, the approach. Um, but, but you have to be a little bit careful uh, because this, this form here, uh, obviously it has singularities at zero, at one and at infinity. So uh, you cannot apply Stokes out of the box so what do we have to do? Well, first of all, we know that this integral is convergent. So let's assume we, have, we can use this. So it means that we can compute the integral by integrating over some domains that uh, exhaust the whole space eventually. So what I do is I cut out a little hole around zero, I cut out a little hole around one, and I cut out a little hole around infinity, which means that I'm integrating only over a very large circle. So the shape looks something like uh, the, the hashed region here on the right. This is uh, the manifold that I want to apply Stokes theorem to. I don't mind the little corners here. They, they are irrelevant for, for the fact we can treat it as a manifold. Um, so we, we, we cut out these little disks here, uh, apply Stokes theorem to apply Stokes theorem. And in the end, we have to take a limit when we make these disks infinitely small. Okay, so now what is, so I, this is what this limit here means. And now if I apply the limit to this funny uh, manifold here, then I get the integral of alpha of this one form alpha over this boundary, this fat red line here, going clockwise around the region. Okay, so uh, how do we compute this? Well, it turns out that when you look at this form actually um, when you're at zero, um, uh, when you're at one, this logarithm vanishes. Uh, when you're at zero, this, this term vanishes. When you're on the real line, so somewhere on these parts of the boundary, then Z is equal to Z bar. So actually this, the form vanishes on the real line. So the only contribution actually, the way I've chosen this alpha here is coming from this arc around infinity. So this is indicated here, but, but notice that when that goes to infinity, then this minus one here in the form becomes relevant. So it just is log of Z over Z bar times D log Z over Z bar. So it's just a half of D log squared if we go to infinity. And then the integral really becomes easy to do because then you apply Stokes again, now to this boundary component and you just have to evaluate this log Z over Z bar at these two uh, endpoints. And because this is a half circle, Z over Z bar makes a full circle. So you actually, the two pi i cancels and the result is only this half. Okay. So, so this turned out to be a very simple calculation if you do it the right way, uh, but I went through it in detail because it illustrates at least some of the ideas that generalize. So we concluded that this, this weight here is a half. And I'll think again of Conservative's formula. So Conservative's formula would say that B1, the, the H bar term of the stop product, is just a single term, there's just this single graph. So we have its operator times its coefficient. We just computed the coefficient to be a half. And the operator is very simple. We have a black vertex. So we have one Poisson bracket and we have one derivative of F from the left edge 
one derivative of g from the right edge. And then because the Poisson bracket is the first order differential operator, this is just another way to write down the Poisson bracket of f and g. So what we've seen that is the, the conceived star product of f and g, well, to zeroth order, it's by definition just a commutative product. And to first order, we get a half ih Poisson bracket. And this looks good because now if you compute the commutator of the star product, um, you will get twice a half ih bar. So you get exactly ih bar Poisson bracket. So indeed, um, the conservative star product has the correct h bar term uh, that we asked from um, star product. So the much more non-trivial statement is of course that this whole thing is associative. Um, any, any questions at this stage? Yeah, I may have missed this, but where did this Concevich formula come from? Oh, ask Concevich. Um, he didn't give any indication in his 97 paper? So, uh, um, well, there, there is a lot of uh, backstories to this. So there is a, I think the modern way to, to form, formulate this is in terms of operads of Swiss cheese operads and uh, Poisson. So, so the, the underlying story is that you have some uh, operad of, of spaces uh, with a boundary. Um, and what you're doing here is that you're computing uh, th these integrals. Um, so, so in order to, to prove the theorem, you have to generalize everything a little bit. So you look at more general integrals you have more than just two blue vertices or you could have also just one or no blue vertices. And when you look at all of the structure that you get from all of these together, um, you get a bunch of configuration spaces of, of disks with points on the boundary or inside and they have a combinatorial structure. So what you would see here is that when you apply these Stokes theorems, you stick things to the boundary and now you have a point. So here I have three points on the boundary. And if you start with bigger graphs, we will get different kinds of configuration spaces and you have morphisms between them. And you, then, then these Stokes theorems you get, um, they give you exactly, they, they give you a bunch of relations of these integrals. So you could say that what I've shown you is that this integral could also be related to an integral over these boundary components uh, of simpler graphs where the two blue vertices are now just one blue vertex that contracted them in some sense. And uh, it turns out that these, these relations then take exactly the shape of the relations of uh, an L infinity morphism uh, that identifies uh, two differential graded Lie algebras that are the, the more fundamental um, thing underlying Konsevich. But I'm, I, I'm afraid, I, I don't know where Konsevich got this from. I, I think it was quite a big surprise for everyone uh, in that paper because it's, the way I presented it, I, I agree, it must look very ad hoc how these definitions come about. Um, I mean, these Gs were vaguely called Feynman-esque graphs. I, I might have assumed you were doing some perturbative expansion of some kind of QFT amplitude. Should I not be thinking that? Uh, you can think that, uh, but that came afterwards. So, uh, so there is a way to interpret all of this in terms of a perturbative expansion of a Poisson sigma model. So there is a work by Katane on Felder who realized that uh, you can set up a Poisson Sigma model um, where the correlation function um, of two operators F and G uh, actually evaluates perturbatively to these conservative intervals. So yeah, if, 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 you're, if you're from such kind of background, that's maybe for you the more illuminating way to think about it. That's a two Sigma model? Sorry? What dimension is that sigma model? What dimension is that field theory? I mean, it's a two dimension, it's a kind of string theory thing. Uh, so you're looking at mapping these disks um, into the, the Poisson manifold. Um, I see, thank you. So, yeah, but, but that came afterwards. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know, maybe. So, so, but of course, Kontsevich might have known about it and just not told anyone. Uh, thank you. So, Eric, are, are you saying that that nonlinear sigma model interpretation gives a, a very, some natural interpretation to this weight integrals? Uh, 
that doesn't seem to yes. be obvious somehow, but it, 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 it. yes, so 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 I you can look at this paper by Katani and Ferde. Yeah. So so you do a this the sigma model setup, and then you have this h bar there in the usual quantum field theory kind of way. Mm. You expand an h bar, you get a perturbative expansion, yeah. and you can interpret them in terms of these graphs. So so mm. in a way, these conservative graphs and weights. You can think of them as Feynman integrals in this sigma model setup. They do become actual Feynman graphs in that model in some way. In in some sense, yeah. I mean, yeah. So they they are the things that index a perturbative expansion of that model. So you might call them Feynman graphs. Yeah. I see. Right. And okay. Actually, by the way, just maybe one more thing: the disks that you're, these are sigma models for maps from the disk, right? Is the disk there the same as the upper half plane in this picture that you're doing right now? Or is it something else? It, it, it is this one, right? So if you think of okay. mm -hmm. so if you think of how you compute a correlation function, right? You mm -hmm. in perturbative theory. So you start with the correlation function of your two operators uh, at two points, say, but now you have an interaction term right. five to the four or whatever that is in this the sigma model. Yeah. So to each higher order in H bar, you get correlation functions of many more things. So yeah. these are now operators sitting at a certain point on this disk. So this is why you get these configuration spaces in higher orders in H bar. You have several points on the disk. Right. Yeah, I see. And you're integrating over all ways of mapping these marked disks. Um, okay. I into see. the space. Yeah. yeah. So that disk is the upper plane. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. That's already. Yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, I, I have no idea what the time is actually. Um, we're very flexible with the time here. So <laughs> yeah, but, but where, where am I at the moment? Um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, 8.55, but uh, uh, the, okay. I think the rule we've sort of established over the month is that people can leave whenever they want and the um, speaker is okay. not to be offended and uh, meanwhile they can speak. Yeah, I mean, I, I can say as, because I don't see any way who is here or whatever, I only see my slides, so I wouldn't even notice if anybody disappears. So yeah, that's right. So you, you can just speak and uh, until, uh, yeah, as long as it's convenient for you. And I mean, if you're the only one left, please stop me. And then, uh... <laughs> no, there's still everybody who started uh, at the seminar is still here. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so let me, so I think I, I have material for maybe uh, 10 or 15 more minutes at max. So it shouldn't be much longer anyway. Sorry, could I ask another question? Oh, yeah, please. So with Consavage's the quantization is that just for the the you know ring of functions on r r to the d or is it for some more general collection of sig of um, Poisson algebras? So there there is a globalization recipe, so you can patch these things on r to the d's together to to something that makes sense on an actual uh, Poisson manifold. But there, there's some machinery there to be to be developed, so you have to talk about this this formal geometry kind of setup and then they use connections to patch things together. So this is worked out. So this is actually what, what a big part of conservators paper is about uh, discussing this part as well. But there's also subsequent work uh, that discusses this globalization problem in more detail. So I'm, I'm afraid I cannot tell you much more about this. I, I don't actually know the details of this, but this is already in conservators paper um, and you can globalize things. So, so he has something for any Poisson manifold. In, in a certain formal sense, you can do things uh, pretty generally. Yeah, you can patch things together, I think. But the problem is, I mean, this is all just formal expansions, right? So you, you know there are examples of, manif of Poisson manifolds where you cannot quantize because there's some topological obstruction. Um, so this will mean that whatever formal thing you construct will be divergent. Ah. Uh. So, so this is a whole different business. So when you want to resum these things for a finite non-zero value of h bar, this is a whole new different box of problems that comes up. So there's resurgence theory that you can apply to resum these things, and uh, but I don't know nothing about that. But it's a you're saying you, you still you always get a, a formal power series in h bar. You get a formal power series, and in some sense you can globalize these formal things, but uh, these do not have to have any convergence radius. And so does, does D have to be even? No, 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 that's the big thing. It does not have to be even. So you can take your three-dimensional favorite Lie algebra or whatever, mm 
or of course anything. So this this is exactly the yeah, artworks for any D. All right. Actually, Eric, just one comment. So the globalization, roughly, is it correct that it goes like this? The coordinate changes, the coordinate transformation over overlaps give you gauge transformations on the quantizations and they patch together. That's the idea, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, good. Very nice. So, um, so what I wanted to talk about is, is these weights, these Ws. Yeah, so, so we already know, because they already proved that these numbers exist, they're real numbers, they're defined by these integrals. And if you use these as coefficients, you get an associative product. But what are these Ws? What are these numbers? This is the question we were looking at. So what are these weights for any graph and how do you compute them? So there is a lot of literature, of course, uh, on this famous work of Konsevich. And in, in many cases, you can compute things kind of by hand or using various tricks and uh, tools. So here I just give you a couple of examples. So this, this half we computed. Now the second graph here, you could also compute because you will see that it's just two black, it's just two times the first one, right? You're integrating over the coordinate of the first black vertex and the coordinate of the second black vertex. But the integrand only depends on the relative position of the black ones, the blue ones but it doesn't depend on the relative position between the black ones because there's no edge between the black ones. So this integral actually factorizes uh, as an integral over only the position of the first black vertex times an integral over the position of the other one. So this is literally just the first integral squared, which is why you get a fourth. Now this, this next integral here uh, is also easy to compute. Uh, it's, it's one of the so-called the Nulli graphs which play an important role if you want to compare Konsevich's formula for the case of Lie algebras, a quantization of dual, duals of Lie algebras. And one, if you want to compare this to the universal enveloping algebra, uh, you have to compute these Bernoulli graphs. Uh, so this is a 12, okay. And then the, the final, only other kind of graph you saw at two vertices is this one with the self with this anti parallel pair of edges gives you one over 24. I mean, you could start to, to stare at these numbers and try to find patterns or whatever, um, but you really should not do because of things like this. So what is this? This is the graph with six black vertices. Every black vertex has two outgoing edges. Everything's fine. So that does appear at order h bar to the six. And what does it evaluate to? Well, it's some rational number, one over 9,920 minus 70 over 64 times this ratio here, zeta three squared over pi to the six. Now this zeta of three is the Riemann zeta function evaluated at three. So it's the sum of all the inverse cubes of the natural numbers. And uh, there is a big uh, research project studying these zeta values now for many years um, because they show up in all sorts of places. Um, and there is a, a big conjecture there, uh, which supposes that all of these values of the Riemann zeta functions at odd arguments, zeta three, zeta five, zeta seven, and so on, they are all algebraically independent conjecturally. And also they should be independent of pi. So in particular, if this conjecture is true, it would imply that zeta three squared over pi to the six is not a rational number. So if that is the case, as, and it is indeed believed that this is the case, um, this weight of this graph here would not be a rational number. It would be some transcendental thing. Um, so there's no point in trying to write everything in terms of little rational numbers. Um, and in fact, it was Felder and Wilbacher who found pretty early on another graph at order h bar to the seven, which also had a zeta three squared over pi to the six in it. So, so we know that at least conjecturally, these things are not rational. Then the question is, well, what are they? And is it an accident that we have the zeta three here? And what can we say about them? So uh, let me just summarize a, a very few facts about these 
zeta values. So it turns out that you can actually answer all of these integrals if you slightly generalize the notion of a zeta value. So these are the famous multiple zeta values, MZVs. And what are they? Whether well, they are multivariate generalizations of the Riemann zeta function. So if they have d arguments instead of just one, and it's a default sum, and that's a nested sum, so the, the indices are ordered, and you just sum the inverse product of the powers of these indices. So if d equals one, you just have a sum of all the natural integers k1, one over k1 to the s1. So it's literally just the Riemann zeta function in the case of a single argument. And if you have several arguments, well, then it's some kind of generalization. It's a double sum or a triple sum or a quadruple sum, which looks very similar to the zeta function. And always you have to nest here, right? If you wouldn't nest, if you would just sum every index from one to infinity, it would just be a product of Riemann zeta functions. So it's really this nesting that makes this interesting. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so you can look at all of these uh, zeta functions. In particular, what we will do is we evaluate these at integer arguments. So like we've seen in zeta three, we will be interested in zeta of one comma one comma two or these kind of things. So these s's will be integers and the sum of these s's is called the weight. And there is a conjecture that all linear relations among these multiple zeta values only occur in uniform weight. So you would never expect zeta of three to be related to zeta of five because they have different weights. So this is why weight plays a, an important role in classifying these numbers. Now, what is the result? Um, so take, take an order h bar to the n in the star product. So what this means is that you're looking at graphs with n black vertices. And then the statement is that you can write this integral, this weight of the graph as a sum of rational multiples of the zeta function such that the weight is exact uh, is at most n. Yeah, so remember what we saw on the slide before, there was an example of a n equals six graph, it had six black vertices. So you would think of the weight as up to six. And indeed what we saw was a rational number. So a rational number we would think of weight zero, say. Uh, and we had the term zeta three squared over pi to the six, right? So here says we have pi to the weight in the denominator pi to the six, and we had zeta three squared. So this is zeta three times zeta three, something of weight three times something of weight three. You should think of this as weight six. So indeed it fits. And this is a general statement. So the higher the weight, uh, the, the higher the order in H bar, the higher the weight of the multiple zeta values that show up. But for any graph, you can always write it as a linear combination of these zeta values uh, up to the corresponding order. So, so this is a statement about what these weights are, what kind of numbers you will get. They will always lie in this uh, algebra of zeta values. And conjecturally, as I said, uh, most of them are supposed to be algebraically independent. So there's a lot of transcendentality in here. And the second part is that the, the way we prove this is by a constructive uh, algorithm. So actually there's a program uh, that's uh, down that you can find on the internet uh, where you plug in a graph and it will compute the, the zeta values uh, expressing it. Um, so there's an algorithm to compute these weights. And we use this to compute the, a database for all graph of six internal vertices. And actually by now it's also including the one with seven. So you can compute the star product up to order h bar to the seven uh, for an arbitrary Poisson structure at the moment. Uh, Eric? Yes. I'm a little bit confused about the i there. These are all yeah. real numbers, right? Yes, 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 yes. So, so you see quite a lot of things from here already, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I will come to this on the next slide. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, exactly. So, so this is important, right? So we have the zeta value. The zeta value is always a real number mm -hmm. divided by i pi to the s. So there's a reason, there's a, there's a deep reason um, in algebraic geometry, why pi always comes with i. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're thinking of periods and tape motifs, mm -hmm. you never get pi, you always get i pi. Um, if, if you want to get pi as a period, you have to integrate dx over x over the circle, say. So somehow i pi is the more natural thing. It really shows up in this way here. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this. Um, so as I said, most of the things about data values are conjectures. Um, so also many things here in this table are conjectures, but actually no, the way I wrote the table, the only conjecture is at the very end actually. So as I said, in, in weight zero, we say there's only the rational numbers. So we only have a single generator. And then actually nothing happens in weight one. It just is the case that the only zeta, the Riemann zeta function at one is divergent. So it's not in the space. So the first thing that you could do is weight two, but you know, we have this normalization by pi. So, right? so we would get zeta two in the numerator divided by pi squared. But due to Euler, we know that zeta two is actually pi squared over six. So actually this, this weight we would get at h bar to the two is secretly a zeta two over pi squared, but actually uh, it's just, a, a it looks like a rational number. Okay. Uh, so the only time we really get something new is at weight three, where we could get zeta three over i pi cubed. Um, but as Mignon just pointed out, well, that would be an imaginary number. And you know, independently, the way Kontsevich defined them, uh, these WGs are always real numbers. So we know that we must land in the real part. So even though this number uh, shows up in the space that I defined for the kind of integrals that we need for the Kontsevich graphs, um, there is nothing we can get from here. So it will still be a rational number. Okay, let's go to weight four. A weight four, there's a couple MZVs you can write down that are convergent. There's zeta four itself, which again, by generalization of Euler's result, is just pi to the four times the rational. Then you can also look at double zeta values, one comma three and two comma two. And you can look at a triple zeta value, one comma one comma two. So that's a triple sum. But it turns out that there are known relations. There's many, many relations between multiple zeta values. And in this case, it shows you that all of these numbers are actually all proportional to each other with very simple rational coefficients. So really the only thing you have here up to rationals is pi to the four, but because we would normalize them by one over pi to the four, again, this just gives us rational numbers. So still nothing new in weight four. In weight five, you can take zeta five, but that's again an imaginary generator. So it's really only at h bar to the six for six internal vertices that we for the first time could get a non-rational number, the zeta three squared over pi to the six. And indeed we saw it, right? It showed up in the example that I showed earlier. And so what you can, so, so what this shows for example, in particular is that all the graphs with up to five black vertices have to be rational because there's just no non-rational multiple zeta value around up to this stage. This is why all these previous calculations always only gave rational numbers because you have to go quite far to see a non-rational number showing up. And then at rate eight, this is where it gets really interesting where you get conjecturally two new transcendental generators in the real part. Um, so it turns out this is the first time where you really need a double sum and you cannot write it at least conjecturally uh, as a polynomial and just single zeta values. And again, I mean, I haven't shown it here, but we've computed a lot of these graphs also at higher weights. And indeed you find that this product shows up and this double zeta value shows up and they show up in a linearly independent way. So there's a conjecture that actually, uh, what I wrote down here at the bottom, that these weights of the graphs, uh, it looks like they really span the entire real part so that all the real zeta values, uh, they, they actually show up as conservative weights. Um, okay, so this, this explains some of the structure on the MZVs and what it means for, for the weights. And then, uh, so I mentioned this, this, the software of computing the weights, there's also a software package that does the expansion of the start products. So you can plug in your Poisson structure and it uh, collects all the graphs together with the weights from the database. Uh, and for example, you can take uh, what's called the log canonical bracket. So that's a very simple example of a, a nonlinear Poisson structure here. Uh, and sorry, you can, 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry, Eric. So, so these are all personal structures on Rn, right? Yes. Are you allowed, as input, do you allow, say, for example, any polynomial Poisson structure, something like this? Yes, for the, the software, you can put any polynomials in, yeah. I see. Uh, but, uh, I, uh, I, but I suppose it's more or less limited to polynomials? Or? Uh, I think we did some example where there were some uh, elliptic functions involved. Ah, okay. mm -hmm. um, so there, but I'm not sure how general the input in the end really is. I mean, certainly you can do all the polynomials, but. Right. Um, but, but is the computation extremely complex? Does it take a long time? It does, yes. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there is room for further improvement of the efficiency of the code, but. I see. The thing is that there's not much point in improving it much more because at the moment we only have the weights to h bar to the six or to the seven, so you couldn't go further anyway. But I mean, I should say there's already at h bar to the six, there's like 40,000 graphs that contribute. Right. But, but what do you mean that you couldn't go any, any further? I don't quite understand. No, I, I just said so at the moment we have tabulated all these weights up right. to h bar to the seven. Right. Um, and if you would want to go to h bar to the eight, you would have to compute a million of these weight integrals. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I mean, in principle, you could do it, but it would take a long time on a supercomputer. So um, mm -hmm. I wasn't very motivated <laughs> to go that far. Mm -hmm. what, what I wanted to say here is that it's an interesting phenomenon that we saw. So suppose you take this very simple innocuous looking Poisson bracket on R to the two, <clears throat> right. And you compute conservative star product, mm -hmm. um, then you get this. So it turns out because it's a quadratic thing, it's always a property when you think of how the differentials behave. That when you, and you take a quadratic Poisson bracket and you take the part of two generators, there will always be something quadratic times the power series in H bar. Mm -hmm. So actually, the x and y structure of this is very simple. It's only in this H bar power series here. And at first, the two things you know. First of all, it looks a bit erratic, different signs not really a, a nice structure here emerging. And secondly, you see this zeta three squared really showing up, right? Because earlier you could have said, well, okay, there is some individual integral that gives this zeta three squared over pi to the six, but who knows, maybe if you sum over all of the graphs, it actually drops out. So this is not the case because you know, you could compute all of the graphs, you could compute the full H part of the six coefficient. This, this really shows up, it doesn't it disappear. So the transcendentals survive in the actual star product. But now you can do an interesting calculation because there is, there's a certain equivalent relation you could do, right? You could uh, reparameterize your X and Y by little power series in H bar. So that would just amount to change in your coordinates a little bit. Um, and, th and then of course you get a different expression. So somehow the invariant thing you know, the quantity that really characterizes the, the isomorphism type of this algebra is when you look at the ratio of the two star products x star y and y star x. And it turns out that if you do this, you compute x star y and you compute y star x, then actually in the ratio, every, all the transcendentals drop out. Uh, and you're left with only rational terms. And, and not only that, the rational terms, they conspire to be just the exponential of h bar. Now, this is something that uh, uh, Brent Pym has been looking at in more detail since then. So there is uh, a prescription by Konsevich, which for quadratic Poisson structure, um, some kind of non-commutative Hodge theory, I think is what it's called, um, that suggests an explanation for this phenomenon. Um, but I think in general, for more general Poisson structures, it's not really clear uh, whether these transcendentals really survive once you go to some isomorphism type characterization. I just wanted to bring this up because I think it's an interesting observation, but I don't have much more to say about it at the moment. So on, on the very last slide, uh, I just wanna mention a couple of ideas of the proof actually of, of what goes into this. Uh, so, so just a couple of remarks. So the, the, the first point to mention is that we're mapping everything to the moduli space of genus zero curves. So well, what is this? So M zero comma two N plus three, well, this is the configuration space of two N plus three points on the Riemann sphere. So if you think of one point sitting at infinity, 
it says two n plus two points in the complex plane. And by the, by the symmetries, the automorphisms of the Riemann sphere, you choose one point to be at zero, one point to be at one. You will already guess this is related to the, the blue vertices. And then we have two n more coordinates. And we choose to label these coordinates by z1 up to zn and z1 bar up to zn bar. What is important at this stage is that these coordinates z1 or zi and zi bar, they're independent holomorphic coordinates on this moduli space. They're not necessarily complex conjugate, okay? Um, so the, the point is that once you think of this configuration space, the, the integrand of the weight integral, the wedge of these angle forms becomes a holomorphic rational form on this configuration space. Because remember it was made out of D log of Zi minus Zj and Zi bar minus Zj. So if you think of the Zs and the Z bars as independent coordinates on this big, big moduli space, and then this is just a rational function. Okay. This is the starting point. We want to compute the integral inside the moduli space. Uh, the second uh, idea is that we integrate one variable at a time. Yeah, so, so notice that each black vertex corresponds to two points here because there's a Z and the Z bar. So if you think of integrating out one of the black points, you're actually forgetting two points. You're forgetting the Z and the Z bar. So the integration we want to do is over these vibrations. So we forget if the first pair of coordinates, Z and Z, Z1 and Z1 bar, then we're down to a moduli space with two n plus one punctures. Then we integrate the next variable and the next and the next and so on. And once you integrated out the last black vertex, you're in M03, where you only have zero one at infinity uh, as marked points. So this is this approach, this iterated uh, pr approach for running along these vibrations and computing the integral over the fibers step by step. Now, in order to do this, uh, you have to introduce transcendental functions. So remember, how did we do the integral uh, in detail that I did for, for the first graph? Um, there, there were some logarithms involved, right? I had this initial form, which was like d log of z over z bar, which d log of z minus one over z bar minus one. But if I want to integrate it, I needed to use these, these functions, log itself, log of z over z bar. So the, the only way to do this integration via Stokes theorem is when you find a primitive. Right, so our, our alpha is our integrand, uh, sorry, alpha is the primitive. So omega is our integrand uh, that I wrote here at the top. Now we want to find a form whose derivative is omega. Uh, and because these forms that omega, they have logarithmic singularities. If we want to find a primitive, it's not going to be a rational function it's going to have some logarithm somewhere. So you need to introduce an algebra of transcendental functions, which includes the logarithms, but, but think ahead, right? Suppose we do the first integration, we get some logarithms on this moduli space with two n plus one mark points. And now we want to do the next integration. So you already have a logarithm and now you integrate again. So well, you will get products of logarithms or more general things, which are called multiple polylogarithms. So if, if you've come across the classical polylogarithms like Li2 and Li3 and so on, they are in here, but even more general functions. The, the nice aspect of this is that uh, there's a beautiful theory of these multiple polylogarithms uh, that has been developed uh, especially by, by Francis Brown uh, on, in this context of the moduli space. So we have an extremely powerful toolbox. So in particular, there's algorithms to compute primitives. So you can show that if you look at rational forms with these polylogarithms as coefficients, that this is an, um, an exact complex, or you can always find a primitive. So in principle, nobody's stopping you from using Stokes to compute these integrals uh, all the way. And this is exactly one of the key ingredients that Francis Brown used to show that all the periods of the moduli space are multiple zeta values. It's exactly using the same strategy. I mean, there you're forgetting a single variable at a time. We are now forgetting two variables at a time. But the idea is the same, to use this multiple polylogarithm sheaf to find primitives uh, and do an induction. 
So when you say you, you, the, an algorithm here, there's some kind of a symbolic algebra algorithm for this primitive. Yes. That you mean. And what you, the answer you get is always a rational thing times some logarithms. Is that... Yes, so, so in this case, the algorithm didn't get exactly. So there's, there's a combinatorial way to encode multiple polylogs. Right. So you write them as element of the bar construction. So yeah. you, you once and for all, you choose the basis of the rational forms yeah. of these D logs that over that I minus the J's the Arnold forms. Once you fix the spaces, you just index them by letters and then you can write down words. Yeah. And so, 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 yeah, so this is how you algebraically encode yeah. the yeah. multiple polylogs and then you get an algorithm. Um, so one of the things we had to struggle with here is the question of single valueness. Um, so the problem here is that uh, in general, you have to be careful when you use functions like logarithms because they can be multi-valued. But remember that the, the things we were integrating were things like d log of zi minus zj. So if you take a primitive, which is just log of zi minus zj, then that doesn't make any sense because this thing has a monodromy when zi and zj move around each other. And that is possible. Um, so you don't actually get a well-defined function on your moduli space to apply a Stokes theorem to. So the thing you have to, so you have to be very, very careful with how you choose your primitives because you want your primitives not only to be locally defined, this is where the naive symbolic algorithm works, you define a locally, you define a little power series, which is a primitive locally, but then you have to make sure that it actually is well-defined globally on the entire integration cycle. So for this, you have to compute the monodromy um, and its representation on the polylogarithm sheaf or on the local system of polylogarithms. But this you can do, this is part of the nice package of polylogarithms that there's a path concatenation formula for chance iterate integrals. So you can compute these monodromies. What, uh, and then there is this property of unipotency. So it turns out that you can co cook up a, a recursive algorithm that step-by-step step, uh, makes the monodromy simpler and simpler of lower and lower weight, uh, and it ultimately terminates. So, um, we, we, we found an algorithm that takes a primitive alpha um, of omega and then adds some correction terms to alpha such that it still remains a primitive. So it doesn't, so we were adding exact terms uh, in such a way um, that, uh, sorry, we're adding closed terms uh, in such a way that um, the monogamy gets, gets canceled. And it turns out that the, the structure of these integration cycles in the moduli space, they're, they're disks, fibered over disks. Um, and this is enough to, to show that this is possible. Okay, so now we have a single valued primitive. So we actually can apply Stokes theorem to these fibers of these uh, fibration maps here. Um, but then there is another technicality as remember that in order to do this, I had to cut out little holes uh, around the marked points, and then then take the limit when these cutout things go to zero. Um, and this you can also do, it's, it's a bit annoying, but you can work through it. So this uses different kinds of regularization. Um, and in the end, we make connection to what's called tangential base point regularization, which is a standard approach to do multiple polylogs. And there's a very technical argument to get the weight right. Remember that I said, for n black vertices, you only get multiple intervals of weight n. If you really want to prove this, there is some, you need to use some global property of the cycle, um, which in our setup is a bit mysterious, but um, we managed to, to find a workaround. So, so we do a regularized Stokes yeah. theorem, sorry. This regularization uh, shouldn't affect the, the answer, I suppose, right? Because Indeed, it doesn't affect the answer, but what you have to make sure is that, right, so I find my primitive and then I want to compute it by restricting it to all the boundary components. Right. And the idea is that these boundary components are smaller moduli spaces and that the restriction of my function to the boundaries is a polylogarithm on those moduli spaces right. so that I get a closed recursion. So you have to regularize in a way that everything stays a polylog right. without ramifications. And it, I mean, it's, it's possible. I mean, it's, it's not super complicated. It's just a bit annoying to, to check that everything converges and is fine. Um, 
Okay, and then the end result is that you're ending up with um, n equals zero, so you're on m03, so you have a multiple polar logarithm on m03. But what is that? Well, it's you can write these multiple polar logs as iterative integrals. I mean, this is really how you work with them uh, in a symbolic manner. And on m03, well, this is uh, a point, <laughs> right? m03 is a point. So this are, these are just numbers and they're given by iterative integrals of forms on this space. So uh, on, on m03, you have essentially, you have a two dimensional cohomology group and you can pick the basis dz over z or dz over z minus one. And then this symbol in the very last line is this, you know, it's an iterated integral. Um, so what it means is you take the first, on my notation, the last from the omega one, you integrate this. This gives you some logarithm of z minus one. Now you multiply it with the next form. So you get log times dz over z, you integrate again. This will give you a dialogue over them. And then so on, you get a three logarithm, a four logarithm and so on. So this is a, a high dimensional integral written in this form. And it's, it's a well-known result that this is the way to represent multiple zeta values. Um, I mean, maybe just a side comment because you mentioned it earlier this is also where the two pi i's show up. If you think of the way these integrals work because there's some choice of path that you integrate from zero to one. If you go around zero first, say, you get some two pi i's in and it's really the ring of periods of M03 that shows up in the final answer. And if you work out what this is, it's exactly the zeta values and then divided by the powers of two pi i because this form omega dz over z minus something, it's not actually um, an integer generator of the cohomology, right? Because the integral over loop would be two pi i. And these are exactly the two pi i's that you normalize by. Um, okay, I mean, of course there's a lot more I could say, but um, to come to an intermediate end, let me just summarize what I said. So uh, quantization um, amounts from one point of view to take a commutative algebra and make it non-commutative. And somehow there is a tendency of transcendental numbers to show up in solutions to quantization problems. So I talked about this problem by Kuntsevich, but there's a much older problem uh, by Drinfeld. So if you're thinking about quantum groups, um, then there are things called Drinfeld associators uh, that play a crucial role there. So these are also collections of numbers which fulfill certain um, relations. And the way that a solution to this constraint is constructed uh, by the Knizic, for the Knizic Samologikov equation is uh, again involves these multiple zeta values. So there's a generating series of these multiple zeta values uh, that already shows up in a much older quantization problem. So it's, it's not a surprise that um, we see these numbers but in this case, they show up in a quite convoluted way. But in the end, maybe the, you can probably translate everything in terms of associators again, but it's, uh, it's not straightforward. But uh, when Kontsevich was writing about this quantization, he was talking about associators somehow, right? Um, it, it's, um, I, I, do remember, I don't know exactly what I'm talking about, but he, he, he kept writing papers and giving lectures, mentioning mm -hmm. them with the same breath, I think. Indeed, so, so there is a way how you can associate an associator to a quantization formula, to a, to oh, a is that form right? I see, yeah. uh -huh. formality morphism. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think the cleanest way that this has been worked out is by Dolgushev's approach. So there is an approach where you say, I mean, forget about these actual weights that consider <laughs> defined. Right. Let's just take these operators, these BGs, Mm. And let's look at the scheme that is defined by all the equations that the, that the weights WG have to fulfill in mm. order for this expression to be associative. Uh -huh. And if you do this, you can show that, uh, first of all, I mean, the fact that it's non-empty, I mean, for this, you maybe use uh, Kontsevich, but um, you can show that modulo a certain equivalence relation, this is a torsor under the growth and Teichmuller group. Uh -huh. Oh, I, see. So, I mean, there, this is already a lot of work where, where a big theorem of uh, Thomas Wilberhard plays into um, about graph complexes. 
but it tells you that uh, modulo uh, um, a homotopy equivalence you can classify all these quantization formulas by an associator so once you know one um, then an associator tells you how to go to another one or, or yeah or once you pick your favorite format uh, quantization say Kontevich and you pick your favorite associator say Drinfeld associator mm. uh, and then then there's a bijection between these two things well, the, this um, is when you you for a fixed Poisson structure that is I mean, I was not talking about uh, quantization um, prescriptions like these formality morphisms right. uh, on, on that level. If you're just at a single Poisson structure, mm. um, there is an equivalence between um, the, the sub products. We have a, mm. each quantization formula gives an equivalence between <laughs> a bijection between equivalence classes of Poisson structures and equivalence classes of sub products. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then the question is how can you quantize, right? Con so sure. far, I only talked about one way to quantize, conservative formula. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about different ways to quantize, right? A different associator is a different way to quantize. Right. Um, and there we have a have a relation. So so yeah, so actually, since then we already talked about it. So so what, what I explained to you is that these weights are multiple zeta values essentially. And, and, and actually the thing we want to do now is to to give this a motivic meaning. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't talked about this at all until this point. So I'm I'm sorry for this being a bit vague and mysterious. But the the way these integrals are defined, you know, we're talking about integrals over the upper half plane. I mean, the integrand is a nice rational form, but the upper half plane is not really a variety. So if you want to make things sense of these weights in algebraic geometry, you have to do some work. Um, so what, what I've explained is how you can map everything to the moduli space, which looks like a step in the right direction. But uh, I've only talked about the differential forms in the moduli space. So of course, what we what we have to use is when we compute these integrals is the structure of the cycle of the integration domain. Hmm. Um, and there you have a problem. The problem is that uh, the boundary of the integration domain uh, it touches the singular locus of the integrand. So if you want to identify these things as coefficients in a, of the comparison isomorphism of a host structure uh, on the moduli space relative to some divisor, uh, you have to do something. So it's not enough to, to take the uh, standard compactification of the moduli space, you have to do some extra right. uh, blow ups. Um, and we are currently trying to work this out. Uh, and why do we do this? Well, once you could identify in a systematic functorial kind of way, Sorry, this should be capital G here. Uh, these weight integrals as uh, periods of, a, of an algebraic variety. And then you would get for free uh, an action uh, of a Tanaka group of the Tanakian category that you're working in. And in this case, um, the expectation is that whatever we construct would be in the category of uh, mixed state motives and ramified over Z. And this is an extremely useful tool. So now you can have a group acting on these things. Mm -hmm. And this is several things. So, so one thing you could ask then is, okay, well, I take my, I take my um, conceived formality morphism, which has these zeta values everywhere. Now, if we could make all of these motivic, then we could act with this Galois group on these coefficients and thereby define a different um, formality morphism, which is still giving you an associative star product because that's the defining property of the Tanaka group. It's a group of um, automorphisms that respects all algebraic relations. Mm -hmm. So it will, it will map associative things to associative things. Right, sorry, uh, the statement you made earlier is that for the fixed Poisson structure, the L infinity morphisms are a torso for the gortonic tachmila group, is that what you said? So, so the, the, <clears throat> the formality morphism knows nothing about a fixed Poisson structure, right? right. Uh, Choosing a Poisson structure is choosing an element oh, yeah, of yeah, the yeah. DGLA into oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So you're looking at this formality morphism, which is taking any poly vector field to some um, some poly differential operator modular relations, right, and then yeah, you're looking at yeah. this space of quantizations. Formality uh, and morphisms, and that's that's the the growth in the torsor. This is the torsor. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, yes. and, and then we have this thing. We have this. Uh, 
torso action, which is defined by the graph complex. I should probably have written capital GRT here. Uh, what I mentioned earlier, when you look at the scheme of stable formality morphisms. Um, but we also have now this action of the Tanaka group of mixed state motives, uh, which we know acts on the growth of the Teichmüller. So there's an interesting question to, to, to see how these relate. Uh, another question is that this Galois uh, co-action on mixed state motives uh, is extremely useful to study relations between multiple zeta values. So you could ask yourself, well, if I compute one of these weight integrals, I have a graph and to this graph corresponds this mysterious zeta value that we can compute by a very convoluted complicated algorithm, but we don't really have a good understanding of, of it. Then, well, you know, it is some element of some representation of this group. So you could ask yourself, can you maybe identify structures in the graph that tell you something about the representation theory of the corresponding integral with respect to the group. Um, so this is something that has been observed in for Feynman integrals, for example. So um, in, in classic and in, in usual perturbation theory of quantum field theory, where you have Feynman integrals in the traditional sense, uh, Francis Brown has a, a setup of uh, Feynman motives. So motivic versions of Feynman integrals, where then also because they're now motivic, you get an action of a Galois group and you can actually see structures in the graph uh, that tell you something non-trivial about this representation. So for example, you can say something about, there's something called the small graph principle. So if you have a graph, I look at its Galois conjugates of small weight, then you know that these must be periods of quotient graphs of just a few edges. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear if something <laughs> of that type really works for these graphs because we haven't done, we haven't defined them yet motivically. But I'm just trying to advertise that once you would have this motivic definition, you would have this big machinery of the Scalawa group acting and everything would be a representation. And that could be very useful to study things, for example, like whether or not uh, these transcendentals drop out uh, and you take certain combinations or not. So whether the representations become trivial uh, or not. So yeah, I should stop daydreaming here. Um, so this is my final slide. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. No, no, that's great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so when you talk about the motivic lift, you're saying that that weight integral should be some value of, a, of an algebraic function on a mixed plate motives or something, right? The actual number yes. of the weight integral should be the value yeah. of an algebraic function. Yeah. And therefore, the, the the Tanaka group will act on that algebraic function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's very nice. Uh, but so. you're also saying that uh, the uh, as of now, even though the formality morphisms form a, a, a torsor for the Grothendieck Teichmüller group, and the Grothendieck Teichmüller group also acts on associators, right? Yeah. The, but uh, the appearance of mixed, multi, mixed uh, multiple zeta values in associators and in your weight weight integrals don't have a direct relation somehow, right? Not 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 from that perspective yet. I so see. so there is a, there are different constructions of the formality mm -hmm. morphisms in the meantime. I mean, I, I talked about Conservator's first construction, but there are other constructions since then, and there's some in particular by Torosian where. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an associator plays a key role. So uh -huh. you first, the summer, you, you, you break down uh, the, the problem of finding a formality uh, to some intermediate step. And then it turns, now you use an associator and then you can make everything work. And so it all depends explicitly on the choice of an associate at some point. So mm -hmm. this suggests that there is a more direct connection. The problem though, is that this is usually working at least to my understanding, I hope I'm not mistaken here. In, in, a, in a context where you have lost the, the explicit handle on coefficients because you're working always modular homotopy equivalences. And so in, in a way, what we're doing here is working with a concrete integral, right? Mm -hmm. And not just with an equivalence class under certain operations. Right. Um, and in this concrete case, I mean, what we're doing in our algorithm, mm -hmm. essentially we, we take this weight integral and ultimately we write it as a period of the motivic fundamental group of M03. Yeah, so every time I use Stokes theorem, what I'm doing is 
I'm replacing this integral over this two-dimensional fiber, which is this punctured upper half plane. Right. I'm rewriting this as a line integral over its boundary. Right. I do this every time. And at the very end, I'm left with only an iterated line integral along a path from zero to one. Right. So I think in a way our algorithm could be seen as a prescription that picks out every WG as some highly complicated combination of coefficients of, of, of the KZ associator. Uh -huh. And then oh, whatever associator you take probably would also do the job because the only relations we're using mm. um, That's interesting. Question to check uh, are the associator relations. But do you, do you suspect that there's a kind of very elegant relation in some sense? I mean, not from our point of view. I, I mean, the way our algorithm works, it is really very convoluted. I see. Yeah. But the, the, this, I don't know, but I mean, one problem of our approach um, for, is this, this fact here that we're working along this vibration. Yeah? So, right. I mean, we did this because this is the minimum you have to do to compute an integral. Right. Um, and it, but it also means we don't understand the global structure, right? So, I mean, this is what we're try, currently trying to do to really define these motivic uh, algebraic versions of these conceivage upper half plane configuration spaces. Mm. Um, and maybe if you have a more global understanding, um, you, you know, you could also apply Stokes theorem, but then you would always reduce to the strata in this global way. And that could be a more symmetric thing, whereas this is very non-symmetric and it right. depends on the order. Mm. I mean, so it's certainly not a canonical way. If you would want to get a more canonical way to write things, in terms of associated coefficients, you would certainly want to go by a global approach. Yeah. By the way, uh, this is a mildly stupid, mildly technical question, but I still don't understand why you wrote m zero two n plus three, because it's, it's a two n degree two n form, but it's still n plus three, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> the space itself. So, so that's. No, that's the thing. So we're not integrating over the full space now, right? So right. actually this is also a big source of, of the trouble here. So maybe I should explain it in more detail. So, so what we've done is we doubled the variables, right? For every black vertex, right. which eventually will be a point of the upper half plane, we introduced two holomorphic coordinates that we treat independently this on this modular space. Mm -hmm. So when I'm saying here, when I integrate out a variable, I'm forgetting two coordinates yeah, yeah. So, this, so that the fiber of this projection is a four-dimensional real thing it's two complex planes oh that's four dimensional oh i see okay yeah but so, the integral is only over a two-dimensional chain mm -hmm. in this four-dimensional fiber i think i understand but it still looks like the isomorphism we wrote in that line above is a bit strange because it's uh this see, is it's, literally it, it's just how i label the coordinates right you could you could so this is zero one infinity. So you could label them Z one up to Z two N. Right. I just label them Z one up to Z N and then the, the N plus one coordinate, I just call Z bar one. Yeah, I see. And then I go to Z N bar. Okay. So at this stage here, the Z bar and the Z, they are not related in any way. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they will become, so, so this two dimensional cycle here, this is exactly the points where Z bar is the complex conjugate of Z right, for right. every point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, this is also the part of the complication comes from that you're working in the double core dimension. Um, so this is why the, the, the chain actually has a non-trivial structure. Yeah. And you really have to, to understand how this change looks. But in this vibration approach, the fiber is always a punctured disk, like I've shown. Um, yeah. Yeah. But because you're treating Z and Z bar as independent, you should really think of Z and Z bar two coordinates in the fiber and you're somewhere sitting in a kind of twisted diagonal in there, twisted by the complex conjugation, right. which is not algebraic. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is the thing exactly because, because you have Z and its complex conjugate showing up explicitly in the differential forms. Right. If you want to think of this as a rational form, mm. You have no other choice as treating that bar as an independent variable. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I see. Okay, now I understand. Yeah. Very good. 
Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I think I've asked a lot of questions. But I, 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 it's fine, I, fine with me. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any questions, actually? Um, I guess maybe a naive question. Uh, I know there's some form of deformation quantization in the setting of, say, more algebraic geometric contexts, um, like perhaps even over other fields that aren't the real numbers. Um, is there some interpretation of the coefficients which appear uh, in that setting, which is comparable? I, I'm afraid I'm, I, I don't have a clear view of how the algebraic, how, how the construction of these quantization over algebraic varieties work. Um, but um, no, I, I, I don't think there is at the moment a clear algebraic geometric understanding of these coefficients. I mean, at the moment, we only have these transcendental expressions. And right. so what you can always say, I mean, you can phrase things in a geometric way, right? As I, as I said here, so, uh, well, I didn't really say it, but uh, when you look at these stable formality morphisms, you can define the scheme of stable formality morphisms, which is defined over Q, and it has rational solutions, um, but you just cannot write any of them down. Right, it's like when you think of the associative, when you think of GRT, uh, I mean, you can think of it as an algebraic uh, pro kind of uh, pro variety or so, pro scheme. Um, and everything's rational, um, but the only points you can actually write down are complex points. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, I guess uh, it's uh, it's quite late. You must be quite tired, Derek. Yeah. So, it's it's pitch black outside. I, I wonder yeah. what time it is. It's close to ten, actually. It's nine fifty now. So yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I'm standing in my kitchen here, so I'm wondering what all the people walking by have been thinking of me for the last hour or two. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> but, yeah. Thanks, yeah. thanks everyone for staying so long. I mean. Oh no! Thanks for the, thanks thanks for the great talk. So, uh, but. Whoever remains, like, let's uh, thanks Eric again. And <laughs> you're most welcome. Uh, okay, have a good evening. Thanks again. Uh, you could too. you send me, send me your slides, by any chance? I'll email you them presently, right after. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Stay, stay well, everyone. Bye, bye. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye. Okay.